Welcome, everyone, to the uh, class. Uh, may I request somebody to please lead us in prayer, and then we will get started. Anybody could lead us in prayer, please. Okay, who wants to pray? Salome, would you like to pray? Okay. First child, please. Go ahead, Prabhakar. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you, we acknowledge your holy name. At this moment, we come into your throne of grace, Father. Thank you for this wonderful moment and opportunity to learn new things. Bless this class, Father. Dear and thanks, start Scarlet. Father, bless Pastor Auntie, so that Father, we shall be lead in your way. Father, bless today's sessions and bless each and every one of you. Father, this class and this session might be engaging. And so learning and so wonderful execution. Thank you. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So we are in the, uh, welcome everyone once again. Uh, we are in the final section of this course, um, which we are talking about the signs of the times, uh, what are the indicators to us uh, about, you know, roughly where we are. We had the whole timeline that we went through. And uh, basically we, we said that, you know, the rapture of the church has to take place before the beginning of the tribulation, the, at the beginning of the tribulation, uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition will be revealed and then everything that gets going, that's from Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Um, so we are right, you know, we are somewhere there very close to the, the, the rapture of the church, the church being taken out of the way. So we are trying to understand just by looking at some of the signs, you know, how close are we? And so we are, we, start, we started this section Let me go ahead and share it, the PDF, on uh, the signs of the times. So some of the signs that we already looked at last week, uh, we talked about Israel being formed as a nation. So God had spoken that he would bring Israel back as a nation into their own land and make them one nation. And, uh, you know, uh, it was almost 2,500 years before Israel could have their land back for themselves and become a nation. The key thing was uh, the Lord Jesus, when he was speaking about this, he said that one generation will see all these signs come to pass. It means this final culmination of these signs will be observed by one generation, is what Jesus said. And so for us, you know, um, of course, to, to determine that one generation, you need a starting point and of which particular generation. So many people use the, the fig tree, the blossoming of the fig tree as an indicator, as a starting point. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So we said, okay, if we do that, if that is, uh, the Bible doesn't necessarily say that is the starting point, but that is a good starting point because we know that the final years, uh, has to do with the nation of Israel. And so the very fact that Israel became a nation is uh, is very significant. And so, you know, you, we could do some approximate uh, uh, calculation. Again, our goal is not to do any predictions, but just get an idea, where are we? So we could either start in 1948 or 1967 and do some calculation based on how long would one generation be and then arrive at some numbers. Um, and, you know, pretty much things are, you know, around where we are already are. And so we are quite close. 
So, uh, uh, but please don't, you know, like I mentioned last week, don't go around <laughs> mentioning a year. That's not the intent of this. Uh, the intent is just to get some sense of how close are we if we use Israel becoming a nation as the starting point, uh, as a reference point. Secondly, uh, we also discussed last week about uh, Jerusalem uh, taken by Israel, um, Israel and it, it becoming a place of conflict or a reason for conflict in the Middle East, which has since 1967. You know, um, so Israel became a nation in 1948, 1967, the Six Day War, they were able to recapture Jerusalem, but that became a big problem, obviously, because uh, it was under Arab uh, occupation for such a long time. So anyway, uh, Israel made some concession. They returned back uh, East Jerusalem. They have access to West Jerusalem and you know, somehow things have been going on. It's always been a point of conflict. Um, between the Palestinians and Israel or the Arabs and, and the Jews. And um, so that is part of what uh, Bible prophecy speaks of. Uh, God says, you know, Jerusalem will become a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people and uh, it will become a heavy stone and the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. You know, that's, so things will begin to precipitate and build up uh, towards that. Um, and it's very interesting, you know, when, okay, we will talk about it a little later when we talk about the dynamics between different nations, how they are, you know, all relating to each other. The third sign we talked about or we mentioned last week was the Temple Mount being ready to be rebuilt. Um, this is also very important because uh, when we, the tribulation, seven years of tribulation involves the temple, especially when we come to the middle of the tribulation. So let's say in the beginning of the tribulation, there is um, a peace treaty so to, uh, or a, a, a covenant of peace that has been put in place by this leader, the Antichrist. And um, um, so obviously the offerings, the um, sacrifices are going on. But in the middle of that, he stops the, uh, in the middle of that seven years, he stops, he puts an end to sacrifice and he sets himself up in the temple of God to be worshiped. So the, for all of those prophecies to be fulfilled, uh, there, there needs to be a temple, right? So how is that going to happen? What we have been, what we have been observing is that the Jews are ready to rebuild the temple. They've made all the preparations and it's very detailed preparations uh, in getting ready to bring temple worship back. So it's not just building a building, it's about resuming uh, the sacrificial, the sacrifices and the forms of worship that they were used to. They are ready. So, uh, uh, we know that this is going to be a very, very tense um, uh, proposition, you know, to build the temple. It's going to be very, very tense. I mean, in our minds, we cannot even, it, it seems impossible now, right? The, because the Temple Mount is occupied by the Arabs. They have control over it. How possibly could there be a temple? I mean, I'm talking about the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount when there's a mosque and uh, it's, just, it's, 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 it's occupied by the Arabs. It's their place right now. How is this ever going to be possible? It seems impossible. But for the word of God to be fulfilled, for the prophecy to be fulfilled, preparations have already been made on one side, on the part of the Jews. The question is how and where and when are they going to build the temple? That's something to be seen, but we are that close. Is it possible? It seems impossible right now, but that's where if somebody, if a man can come and bring about this kind of solution, 
where he's appeasing both sides. He's able to give the Jews what they want, the Arabs what they want. He's got to be considered a brilliant, uh, you know, like the world leader the world has been waiting for. If there could be somebody who could do this, because since the 70s, different world leaders have tried, they've tried to have, bring about this peace, a peaceful settlement to the problems right there in Israel. No one has succeeded. No one has succeeded. So if a man, a leader, could do this, he'll be considered a genius. And so that opportunity is there. And uh, it's very likely that this Antichrist will step in and be able to do that. Because the Bible talks about him setting in place a covenant of peace. So this is interesting to observe that everything is set. Uh, just that this one step has to happen. So we, we, we covered till here. Now we were talking of the fourth one, which is the 10 region confederacy. Uh, if you will turn with me uh, to Daniel uh, chapter 2, I just want to point out, I mean, there are many scriptures on this, uh, but I want to point out what this 10 nation confederacy is. And we will study Daniel, uh, the whole, all the prophecies in Daniel next year. But I want us to understand Daniel chapter 2 and uh, just look at, um, I'll just pick up and give you the verses that we should read. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's read, please, verses 38 to 44. Daniel chapter 2, verse 38 to 44. The main part that I want us to focus on, of course, is towards the end of this passage. But could somebody read this, Daniel chapter 2, 38 to 44, please? Shall I read, Pastor? Go ahead, please. Jan Daniel chapter 2, verses 38 to 44. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hands, hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall rise and another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they, they will mingle with the seed of men and they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a king, a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Amen. Amen. So this past, this prophecy, Daniel chapter 2, of course, it was what Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which God revealed to Daniel and God, Daniel speaks it out and then he interprets it, is the framework for all the prophecies that unfold in Daniel the subsequent chapters. But this is very powerful. Uh, just to quickly help us understand this, you know, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of this huge image. The head was made of gold. The breast was made of um, silver. The, the waist was made of brass. The feet were made of iron. 
uh, the legs, the legs were made of iron, and then the feet was a mix of iron and clay, and it had ten toes. Of course, there were ten toes. So, this becomes a framework of the prophecy that's then further developed in the book of Daniel. And so Nebuchadnezzar saw this image, and then he saw a huge rock that was not carved by men's hands. This huge rock came and it crushed this image. And then it became a big mountain that spread all over the earth. So that's the, that's the dream he had. Right? So then Daniel interprets the dream. He says, you know, he begins in verse 38, you are the head of gold. That means the head of gold represents the Babylonian kingdom. So Daniel prophesied about the, the empires or the kingdoms to come all the way to the million, millennial reign of Christ. So he said, you are the head of gold. That is the Babylonian kingdom. After you comes, you know, after him, after that came the Medes and the Persians. They were the chest of silver, Medes and the Persians. And we know it as, you know, I, I'm just summarizing it, but as you read the prophecies, all these details are given. Then come the, the waste of brass, that is the Greek empire. And after the Greek, so he mentions, Daniel actually mentions Babylonian, that is Nebuchadnezzar. Then he does mention the Medes and the Persians. He does mention the Greek empire, right? So he mentions it. Then the feet of iron represents the Roman empire, which, is, which became bigger than all the previous empires. So the Roman empire extended through all of Europe into across the agency uh, into, you know, what is modern day Turkey and Iran, uh, Persia, all the way there in the northern part of Africa. So the Roman Empire extended, you know, it covered a huge, it is much bigger than the previous three world empires. But Daniel spoke about it. He said, it's going to be the feet of iron. But then what will happen is after that comes, it's going to be a mix of iron and clay. What is that? Iron represents the Roman Empire. Countries or regions that belong to the Roman Empire. Clay, like he mentions here, uh, is they will mingle with, verse 43, they will mingle with the seed of men. That means there will be other nations mingling. So today, when we look at Europe, right, what, what do we know about Europe? Well, much of Europe, not all, but much of Europe was part of the Roman Empire. And today, what form is it? It is in this iron and clay mixture form, meaning it's a loosely held uh, conglomeration of so many nations, loosely held. Many of them were part of the Roman Empire, iron, and they're also mixed with other nations, clay. So that's what we find in that. Uh, so verse 43 is being fulfilled right before our eyes. So uh, that's why we look at the European Union with a lot of interest because that union is this 43, verse 43, a loosely held mix of iron and clay, nations that belonged to the Roman Empire, former Roman Empire. And now there are all the other, you know, mix the seed of men, which is they are, uh, 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 they're, and they're loosely held, you know, they're not like a firm, tight, integrated union. They're loosely held. They're all, they all have their independent uh, governments, but they are from one union. So that's what he describes there in 43. And then he talked about um, 10 toes, uh, 10 toes of us. Now, in this in this particular dream, the ten toes are not emphasized. They're only mentioned. But later on in um, chapter 7, chapter 8, the ten toes become prominent because the ten toes represent ten leaders or ten nations, and out of them come ten horns. So ten nations that are very significant in this loosely held uh, grouping of nations which was a mixture of those who belonged to the former, former Roman Empire as well as others. Now, if you look at, in the world today, there are many of these such you know, groupings. NATO is one of them, but NATO has 
uh, so you know NATO could be one you know, uh, you know what was spoken of in verse 43 the European Union could be what was spoken of in 43 because the key that we're looking for is nations that that were made of iron that means nations that belonged to the former Roman Empire plus other nations right so it could be NATO it could be European Union and, and so when we when you look at you know various nations coming together like this it's also, but that's very interesting because that's what Daniel spoke about in verse 43 right a mix of iron and clay but what he went on to see in what we will see as we progress in the book of Daniel is he says out of this will come ten toes ten major leading nations and out of these ten toes come ten horns meaning the leaders the horn always represents the leader right so out of the ten toes each each toe each each nation has a horn a leader and there's going to rise up another leader who comes from a country that belonged to the Greek Empire and that and Daniel refers to him in his visions as the small horn so that means he's not a very powerful leader but he emerges from what was part of the former Greek Empire and he influences three of these ten leaders and they put this man into prominence and that 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 small horn is the Antichrist all right so all of that is given to us in the book of Daniel which we will you know study in detail next year but the point I want to say is over here in Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 what else do we see it says here and in the days of these kings what kings the kings that emerge from this loosely held region of the iron and clay so today we have this loosely held region of iron and clay and we can see 10 nations who are the leading nations in that whole uh, uh, association or union and uh, or, or organization you know. and out of them come 10 horns or 10 leaders and he says in verse 44 in the days of these kings the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ so that's how close we are that means look we are seeing this loosely held region of iron and clay it's very evident before our eyes whether you look at it as NATO or European Union you know it could be one of the two we don't want to get zero in uh, you know many think about it as the European Union it's it's okay however you look at it but the criteria is iron and clay are mixed and then you can see okay the possibility of these 10 leaders emerging strong players so we are that close because it says in the days of those kings the God of heaven will set up his kingdom here or not that means that rock that came out of heaven and crushed all of this it just says okay all this is gone there's only going to be one kingdom it's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and that's what happens in the millennial reign right so that is number four the possibility of these ten toes emerging whether it comes out of uh, the EU or the NATO or some other association uh, it's okay for us it's you're not you know the Bible doesn't specify what kind of what the name of it is what the Bible does give us is it's a mix of iron and clay it's a mix of nations who belong to the former Roman Empire and from other parts other races or other seed of men people it's a mix and we are seeing that happen number five 
Another important part of Bible prophecy, end time prophecy, which we, we mentioned, in, and we see this in Revelation 13 is, and if you want, we can actually break these into two signs. You know, we can call it a global currency system and a global identification system. So you can make it five and six if you want. Uh, I've just, you know, combined the two. Um, so the, in Revelation 13, for Revelation 13 to be fulfilled, what do we see in Revelation 13? And we, we went through it a couple of weeks back. We see that when the first beast, that is the Antichrist, and the second beast, which is the false prophet, when they come, they're going to introduce a system where you cannot buy or sell. That is, buying and selling has to do with finances, currency, a financial system. All over the world, people cannot buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. So, in some way, the Antichrist is going to control the global financial system. So instead of saying currency, we could say economic system, or we could say financial system. I just put currency, I, I probably will change it uh, and call it a financial system or something, because currency, you know, people will think in terms of euros or dollars or whatever. Uh, this is not necessarily having to do with currency in the sense of a particular uh, uh, form of currency, dollars, euros, whatever, but it's a financial system. You cannot buy or sell, you cannot transact. So there's an economic system set up, global. Unless you have the mark of the beast. Now we saw, secondly, we saw in Roman Revelation 13 that this mark of the beast was something that was put upon people's hands or foreheads. So it becomes a very personal individual identification system. So these two things are tied together. There's an economic system, a financial system, and there's an ID system, global. And they are tied together in Revelation 13. And so what we are saying is, hey, we are living in a day and a time when this is possible. It can happen. You know, it doesn't take much to make something like this happen. In fact, um, if you look at how, you know, identification systems are there, the kind of identification systems that are there in the world, will be amazed. And China is one of those nations, and, and you probably know this, but China is one of the nations that is putting this identification, identification system to use in a big way. So um, there are entire cities that, um, I, I think Chongqing is one of those cities where they have CCTV cameras and they have a, they have a complete uh, center where everybody is monitored. So every human person in that city is monitored. And nothing but just your facial recognition, that's all. They just, uh, just facial recognition system. They can identify every person in that city. So when you're crossing the street, and I was just watching some documentary on this, you know, when you're crossing the street, if you cross when you're not supposed to, immediately you're recognized because there are CCTV, there are these CCTV cameras everywhere. If you cross the street when you're not supposed to, you're immediately recognized and there is a display that shames you or that tells you, you know, you violated something. I don't know if they have uh, any penalty on it or something. So, you know, nobody, no, there's no need for a policeman or something. You, it's, it's just, the whole city is monitored. So just by facial recognition. So that's, that's one very powerful identification system. And then even, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Ukraine war, in the war in Ukraine right now, uh, well, all that's happening. Uh, I think 
uh, I forget which company, I think it's a company in Ukraine, or uh, I, I, I might be wrong on this because I forget. It. But I think it's a company from Ukraine so that was that was offering a complete identification system uh, where uh, to the Ukraine government to identify people. Uh, you, 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 they, they basically have taken in you know, images from the internet to identify people. And, uh, and so again, using facial recognition, so on, um, where you know, when people are injured or killed in, in, in the battle, in, in war, uh, at least there's some way to identify who is this person. And they offer the system to the Ukraine government to help them do this. So it's quite amazing when you think about, and this is all just facial recognition, you know, using that technology. But when you think about what is possible today in terms of an identification system, which has a certain mark that has to be put on your hand or your forehead, and you're immediately recognized, we can say 100% it can be done. Same thing with a global financial system. If we want to force people to, and say that, look, in order to transact, this is how it's going to be done. It can be done, right? So for Revelation 13 to be fulfilled, we are living in the day and time when it can actually happen. So there's that possibility of this being fulfilled. Another, Interesting observation is the geopolitical interactions that are going on globally. The alignment of various nations with each other. Because when we get into Ezekiel 38, um, and we can just turn there, uh, just point out um, what we're looking, what I'm, what I'm, what, what we are mentioning over the media is equal to the A, right? And if you could read um, verses one, I think we'll have to go through um, one. Yeah, I think we have yeah, one through nine. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9. If somebody can read that for us, please. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9. Ezekiel 38, verse 1 to 9. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, prophecy against him and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, fully armed and a great heart with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Kush and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets, also Gomer with all its troops and Beth the Gurma from the far north with all its troops, the many nations with you. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hosts gathered about you and take command of them. After many days, you will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had been brought out from the nations and now all of them live in safety. You and all your troops and the many nations with you will go up, advancing like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. Mm. So, Ezekiel 38, very interesting. 
uh, Ezekiel 30 and 39, uh, as basically speaking to us of this final conflict that's going to happen, the battle of Armageddon, the whole build up towards it. Um, and uh, Ezekiel is mentioning, you know, names, Gog, Magog, Prince of Rosh, otherwise Russia, Meshach and Tubal, tribes in northern or uh, I think it's northwestern part of Russia. And he says, I'm against you, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. So Meshach and Tubal are these tribes in Russia. And he says, what's going to happen? You're going to, you know, get, get, get into war, war mode. And who are going to be with you? Verse 5, Persia, which is basically Iran, Iraq, the, those Arab nations, Ethiopia and Libya, where well, that's verse 5, are going to be with you. So, and Gomer, Gomer is um, uh, what people say is a, was part of Eastern Germany. Gomer, all its troops. The house of Togorma, that is Turkey, from the far north. So it's no, north Turkey, north of Israel. And many people are with you. So other nations are also joining together. Many companies all gathering together. And what are you going to do? You're going to go against the people. This is verse 8. Who've been gathered from the nations and brought back to the mountains of Israel. And they're living safely. But you're going to ascend and many people. And you're going to come to war against this land, this people. So, so it's very interesting. He's saying, okay, there's Russia. He references Russia. He references Iran. These, these. Um, he mentions Turkey and he mentions, you know, other uh, uh, Arab nations. Uh, they are all going to come together and begin to move towards this land, Israel. Now, of course, here we don't have mention of China. Uh, China comes in, you know, from Revelation. Uh, uh, from the book of Revelation, I think it's um, when he talks about the um, the armies from the east. So, um, uh, let me see now, yeah, where was this? Revelation 14, I think it was, 12, 13, or was it Revelation? No. Yeah, the kings of the east, this is. The kings of the earth, gather yeah, Revelation 16, and this is Revelation 16, 12. Right? Kings from the east, the way the kings from the east may be prepared. So he doesn't mention China, but when he says kings from the east, we're looking at all the nations from the east of Israel, which and if you look at the larger nations, it would be China. So it's interesting then for us to look at, you know, how is Russia relating to China, relating to Turkey, relating to these uh, Arab nations, how are they working, right? And, and and it's interesting to see that now China and Russia are, you know, I know China is, China is in a very difficult position because of what Russia is doing, but it's just trying to, you know, don't do anything to rock the boat, you know, at the same time, you know, just hold, hold on, you know, maintain relationships on both sides. Uh, of course, China has, uh, uh, you know, extended its influence uh, around the world. It's become very powerful, and uh, it's strengthening it. It's it has already, you know, made huge investments in Iran, which is part of what Persia was referenced. We we saw that um, uh, Russia is strengthening its ties with Turkey, and recently Turkey tried to, uh, you know, uh, act as a mediator in some way. Uh, with what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, uh, you know, trying to exert its, some inf uh, influence. Turkey itself is becoming very, you know, uh, nationalistic, the, the, the Turkey's president. So uh, when you look at all these interactions, especially in the light of what Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 16 has mentioned, you know, uh, it's like, okay, so things are aligning themselves in such a way that if Israel was going to become this place of conflict, where would all of these nations be? You know, how would they? Be? Now, when you think about it, right now, right now, in fact, just yesterday, I think it was, 
that the Ukrainian president had addressed the the uh, Israeli, or you would call it a Israeli parliament or the members of parliament, um, and he, he was he was upset that they were not taking sides. Now suppose Israel took sides with Ukraine. No, no, Israel is trying to you know be neutral, but they they're not, they're not getting in, trying to trying to stay out of this. But if they are dragged into this in some way and take sides with Ukraine, I mean, immediately they're going to be on the other side of Russia, meaning Russia's going to, uh, you know, okay, they're, they're not on our side. So while all these things are happening, it's, it's interesting to keep our eyes open and see how are these nations aligning themselves? You know, what would they do if some conflict took place in Israel? Whose side would they be? It is interesting to observe. And all I can say is, you know, we look at Ezekiel 38, look at your newspaper. You know, look at Ezekiel 38, look at what's going on in you know, the news and see how things are being aligned. But as of the way things are going, we are seeing these nations, you know, just strengthening their relationships. So that if one of them decides to go against Israel, it's very likely they, they will have allies in the others and they will drag them all in against Israel. Okay, So that's interesting to see and observe because that's part of the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and Revelation 16. Okay, so number seven, let me try to, let me try to, just begin this and then we can take a break. So the next thing is this. It's very interesting. Could somebody read for us Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, please? I'll read. For behold, in those days, and at that time, when I break back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jezebel. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. Thank you. So in Joel, saying God is saying, you know, I will gather all nations and bring them to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So this is where the battle of Armageddon is going to take place. So this is basically Revelation 16, 12, 13, 14. Right? The, the nations are beginning to move towards Israel, right? And God is going to defend his people, right? But one of the things he mentions, why... God is, you know, why all this is happening is they have also divided up my land. So they have divided the land. And that's interesting. Because if you look at, like we said, you know, the problem in Israel, there are two major things. One is, should is it should you know the land uh, the land that belongs to Israel that belongs to the Jewish state should uh, you know should the land that is now occupied by the Palestinians on uh, the the West Bank and on in Gaza the Gaza Strip should it be recognized should the Palestinian States be recognized as uh, 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 in, in a, a nation, an independent state, right? So that's one uh, problem, and uh, of course, the second problem is the whole Temple Mount. Who is going to have control of the city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount? These are the two major problems in the Middle East with Israel and Palestine and the Arabs. And 
Now, nobody has forced a solution. It's very difficult. What Israel is doing is it's slowly, you know, building up its own settlements and taking over the land uh, when the Palestinians are. Palestinians want their own land. And uh, every proposal has been trying to encourage Israel to say, okay, why don't you just give the land to the Palestinians and let's recognize them as as a separate state. You know, and of course, they're on two parts of, they're on either side of Israel. Israel doesn't want to do that. Uh, refuses to uh, recognize palace, the Palestinians. And uh, so things are just, you know, left like that. But what this verse, Joel 3, verse 2, seems to indicate is that one of the reasons for conflict, one of the reasons this, all this is going to precipitate is somebody is going to force the division of the land. See, right now, every, every person trying to make peace is only like the EU, you know, so okay, or the UN. Uh, so the EU says, look, we don't recognize all, you know, uh, the settlements and what, what Israel is doing there. And, um, and other Arab nations, of course, will not recognize what Israel is doing. Uh, and uh, so somebody's going to come and say, the land has to be divided. And that is going to precipitate into a big war. One of the things that is going to lead to that. They're going to lead to it. So it says, they have also divided up my lands. And that will cause the nations to gather. So if you want to imagine, okay, so I, I, I'm just imagining now. I'm just imagining. So think about the seven-year tribulation. Okay, so this is not chapter and verse. I'm just imagining how all this might play out. Think about the seven-year tribulation. The Antichrist begins as a man of peace. He is somewhat brokered some sort of a peace treaty, I think, between the, the Jews and the Arabs. And uh, he's been able to get uh, uh, the temple in place. The worship is happening, the offerings happening, the sacrifice happening in the temple. Middle of the seven years, he, the Antichrist changes. He stops the sacrifices. He puts himself up as God and demands him to be worshipped. And he probably goes a step further to say, I'm going to divide the land. So I'm saying probably because this is my, this is imagination. The Bible doesn't say that. But he's going to say, we've got to divide the land. I'm just saying it based on Joel 3, 2. Right? We're going to divide the land. It's almost like, you know, we're going to carve out this land for the uh, Palestinians and we're going to set them up as a state, whatever, you know. And then Israel is going to call on its allies and say, come on, you got to help us fight. We are not going to give this up. So the, those nations that back Israel are going to come on one side. And then the Palestinians, because they are Arabs, the Arab nations are going to say, hey, all those who are for us, come on, we're going to go against Israel. And they're going to pull, you know, Russia is going to take the lead initially, going to come in with Turkey and Persia, Iran, and uh, they're going to move in there. So nations are going to begin to gather. Why? Because they've decided to divide up the land. So why is this significant? Because... This is Bible prophecy, Joel 3, 1 and 2. It's been said, this is the reason why the nations are gathering. They've decided to divide the land. Is this possible? Very much, very much. So this will precipitate into what we call the battle of, what the Bible calls the battle of Armageddon, building up in Revelation chapter 16. So let me pause here. I didn't uh, give you time for questions, but uh, when we come back, um, we will uh, take some time for questions and then we will uh, move forward. 
uh, everyone is with me so far? Did he get left out somewhere, somewhere in Russia, Turkey, Iran? Everyone's with me? Okay, great. All right, let's uh, take a quick break and uh, we will uh, come back in 10 minutes, okay? Thank you.